American pilots flew thousands of bombing missions against North Vietnam throughout the mid-1960s. They confronted the most formidable anti-aircraft defenses on Earth, while operating under the most complex and restrictive rules of engagement in history. Hundreds were shot down and killed. Hundreds more were imprisoned for years. But for more than three and a half years, the men continued to hurl their aircraft into combat each day with the hope that they could put an end to a bloody struggle that ultimately claimed millions of lives. This is the story of the pilots who flew those missions. It is the story of Rolling Thunder. On a beautiful day in October of 1967, Major Bob Barnett was leading a flight of 16 F-105s on a strike mission into some of the most heavily defended territory in North Vietnam. Supporting the flight were several F-105 wild weasels, which had moved out in front of the strike force to guard against the launch of lethal surface-to-air missiles. The pilots received surprisingly light anti-aircraft fire as they approached the capital city of Hanoi. But suddenly, a warning light lit up in Barnett's 105. A SAM site had come online, and at least one missile had already been fired. The flight of weasels immediately turned back to try to help the force. They were coming outbound and they fired two SAMs. And of course I knew they were up and I was sort of looking for them. And the weasel pilot said, no sweat, it's going behind the force. And next thing, this thing goes off right behind me. It didn't hit the airplane, it went off right maybe about 40 or 50 feet behind the airplane. Of course it blew into the airplane. And the airplane is porpoising and um, of course I got firelax right then. So I turned and just as I rolled out, I could feel the controls getting stiff. So I looked down and I saw I had no hydraulic pressure. And there's of course a lot of chatter on the radio, so I told the flight to go over on uh, another channel so I could talk to them and find out, you know, what, what they see with my airplane. And so I went over there and they all checked in and then I lost my radio. So I wasn't quite sure what had happened. Barnett was just north of Hanoi when he was hit. For several minutes, he struggled to fly out to the coast of North Vietnam, which he could clearly see in the distance. But he soon lost all oil pressure. The 105's massive engine ground to a halt, and Barnett's plane started to roll. Seconds later, he was forced to eject. A survival raft became entangled in the lines of his chute as it deployed. He struggled furiously to free more of the canopy as he plummeted toward the jungle below. I was kind of spinning around going down. And there's a beautiful day and I was sitting there going down. I could see Hanoi and I'd go swing around and see Haiphong and, uh, you know, all the energy. I just saw almost a spin. Anyway, I was going down and I, I got close to the ground and I knew that I, I'd probably fallen fairly fast. And I was going into the trees and so I put my feet together and I felt myself go ricocheting through the branches and then I fell for about 10, 15 feet into a bunch of bushes. So I got out of the parachute and uh, I uh, tried to get away from there pretty quickly and I went up to a little area and I uh, got on my radio and I called them and I said I was ground and I was okay. Barnett managed to evade North Vietnamese troops for two days. But on the third day, he was captured. For the next five and a half years, he remained a prisoner of war in various facilities, including the notorious Hanoi Hilton. Barnett was one of several hundred airmen shot down during the first phase of the American air war against North Vietnam, during a campaign that came to be known as Rolling Thunder. My fellow Americans, as president and commander-in-chief, it is my duty to the American people to report 
that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. On August 5, 1964, President Lyndon Johnson ordered limited airstrikes against North Vietnamese targets in retaliation for alleged attacks against U.S. destroyers operating in the Gulf of Tonkin. Additional strikes were conducted for several more months in response to specific attacks launched by Communist Viet Cong forces in South Vietnam. But on March 7, 1965, Johnson's policy of limited retaliatory strikes gave way to rolling thunder, a sustained bombing campaign against North Vietnam that lasted for more than three and a half years. In theory, the strategy behind the campaign was simple, gradually increase the intensity of bombing raids until Ho Chi Minh and the government of North Vietnam realized that a Viet Cong victory in the South was not worth the price. In reality, though, complex implementation of the campaign, coupled with the fierce determination of the North Vietnamese, resulted in one of the largest air wars in history against one of the most heavily defended countries on Earth. Many pilots had serious doubts about the effectiveness of rolling thunder from the start. The chain of command for day-to-day -day operations literally stretched all the way to the White House. President Lyndon Johnson retained almost complete control over which targets could be attacked. Johnson's decisions were relayed to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who in turn provided a list of targets to the Pentagon. Eventually, the list made its way through the chain of command and the targets were fragmented, or fragged, among various Air Force and Navy aircraft stationed throughout the region. The convoluted and highly political targeting process caused tremendous concern among strike crews from the earliest days of the campaign. The first target that I was assigned on the Forrestal, I still remember vividly. I went up to where the briefings took place, I punched in the target number and uh, pictures of the target came out and that target had been bombed 27 times before. It was a pile of rubble. It was called the Vin Military Barracks. A very short distance away was a bridge, a bridge that was obviously used to transport supplies and troops to the south. That, that bridge was not on the target list, so we were not allowed to strike it. Dozens of highly strategic targets remained off limits for most of Rolling Thunder. There was a 30-mile restricted area around Hanoi and a 10-mile area around the port of Haiphong. MiG bases and SAM sites that were under construction were also generally off-limits. And strikes were never directed against the extensive network of dams and dikes, which would have caused significant damage to food supplies and flooded vital transportation routes. President Johnson and Secretary McNamara defended these restrictions, citing concerns about a widening war that could involve China or the Soviet Union but they became increasingly troublesome for strike crews who felt that they were being sent into combat with one hand, if not both, tied behind their backs. We were very frustrated by our inability to hit targets that need to be hit. We could observe uh, Russian ships coming into the port of Haiphong, offloading surface-to-air missiles. Those missiles taken on trucks and put into position, either around Haiphong or Hanoi, which we could not strike. And then, of course, having to dodge those same missiles uh, sometime later. Debate about targeting restrictions continued throughout the campaign. But there was also tremendous concern about the strategy for employing air assets once a target was authorized. In March of 1967, frags were issued for strikes against the Taiwan Iron and Steel Works. The steel mill had previously been off limits 
despite the fact that it was the only facility in Southeast Asia that manufactured critical bridge sections, barges, and oil drums. On March 10th, F-105s and F-4s from Thailand began launching on missions against the mill. Poor weather prevented the force from launching nine days earlier, when less than 300 guns defended the site. By the time the weather broke, more than a thousand guns and six SAM sites had been moved to within five miles of the target. At least seven aircraft were lost on the first mission alone. Despite mounting casualties, repeated strikes were ordered against the same targets throughout the month. There were three major separate areas in a steel mill. One was the ability to transport the steel out, load it, and get rid of it. We hit it for 10 days. It was dead after the second days. We continued to hit it for 10 days, twice a day. Karat Takli, go in there, bomb snot out of it. And we're losing airplanes like when I was We probably lost 15 or 20 airplanes on a stupid uh, 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 rail facility. Then we moved over and took out the blast furnaces. And we did it for 10 days. Then it was dead after the second day. And they moved in more and more SAMs, more and more guns, more and more MiGs. We lost a whole group of other guys. Then we went to some other piece of crap. And by the time we're through, we've been here for 30 days. Place looks like the moon. And we could have finished the whole bloody thing in three or four days. Many pilots attributed heavy losses at the steel mill to poor tactics set forth in the frags issued for the strikes. Frag orders were often written in great detail, preventing flight commanders from using their discretion to adjust tactics as necessary. The process angered many pilots, who felt that poor planning and excessive control by men far removed from the fighting frequently resulted in unnecessary losses. At Taiwan Iron and Steelworks, strike pilots were ordered to fly the exact same ingress and egress routes at exactly the same times against the same targets day after day. Pilot concerns about the policies and strategies behind Rolling Thunder were further heightened by the declaration of numerous bombing pauses. The first bombing halt was declared only nine weeks into the campaign. So many bombing halts were eventually ordered that a major study by U.S. government historians could not account for the exact number that took place. The pauses were intended to encourage the North Vietnamese to reconsider continuing support of war in the South. But in reality, their impact was far different and usually resulted in much worse conditions for pilots when they returned to the skies over North Vietnam. The Vietnamese uh, used these opportunities to jam the roads with trucks and supplies going south. And they told me themselves that they were incredulous that we would uh, give them this opportunity to rebuild their defenses and to uh, supply the South by declaring these so-called bombing pauses. And that, of course, was uh, frustrating to those of us who were trying to uh, conduct the war in a successful manner. As the Vietnam War escalated and the anti-war movement in the U.S. grew, some erosion in morale began to take shape among ground forces that were taking heavy casualties in the South. For the pilots who flew strike missions against the North, there was also anger and frustration. But it was largely limited to debate about the policies and strategies that were limiting their success while costing them dearly. Even though we were severely limited in the kinds of, uh, of combat that we could engage in and the rules of engagement were so strict, there was also a belief that uh, we were uh, going to hopefully bring the war to an end. And remember, this was before the anti-war movement became so strong and uh, so active in the United States. It was still a kind of a, of a uh, certainly in the, circles that I was in in the military, a belief that we were doing the right thing. U.S. bombing missions against North Vietnam were split between Air Force squadrons stationed in Thailand and naval squadrons that launched from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin. Naval strikes were carried out by pilots in A-4 Skyhawks 
advanced all-weather A6 intruders, and late in the campaign, A7 Corsairs. But it was the pilots of the small and simple Skyhawk, a single-seat, light-attack aircraft capable of operating from the shorter decks of older carriers that bore the brunt of offensive operations during Rolling Thunder. The vast majority of Air Force bombing missions were carried out by the pilots of F-105 Thunder Chiefs stationed at Karat and Takli Royal Thai Air Force bases. The Thunder Chief, or THUD, was one of the biggest and fastest single-seat aircraft of its time. It was designed during the height of the Cold War to be America's premier nuclear strike fighter. But in Vietnam, hundreds of 105s were modified to carry large loads of iron bombs, rockets, and missiles. In order to reach targets from their bases in Thailand, pilots had to refuel the heavily laden bombers almost immediately after takeoff. As soon as all of the thuds had topped off, the strike force crossed the border into North Vietnam and ingressed toward their target. A typical Air Force strike package initially consisted of four flights of four 105s spaced several minutes apart. The pilots normally remained at medium altitude, roughly 12 to 15,000 feet, until they reached the Red River, which ran from China in the northwest right through the capital city of Hanoi. The force then dropped to treetop level and used landmarks, such as a line of mountains that came to be known as Thud Ridge, to guide them to their target. The North Vietnamese air defense network was relatively primitive at the start of rolling thunder. A few anti-aircraft guns posed a serious threat, but the vast majority of ground fire came from local militia units armed with everything from Russian AK-47s to handguns. The 105s often maintained speeds of 5 to 600 knots at altitudes of less than 100 feet to minimize their exposure time. At the last second, they quickly popped up and rolled in at an extremely steep angle of attack. The strategy appeared sound in theory, but nobody had anticipated the enormous amount of fire the crews would take from below. At least five aircraft were lost on the first Rolling Thunder mission. A surface-to-air missile brought down an American aircraft for the first time on July 21, 1965. By the end of the year, 10 more had been downed and dozens more had been lost to ground fire. Both the Navy and the Air Force began experimenting with various forms of electronic warfare in an attempt to prevent the loss of additional aircraft. Among the most effective was the support provided by Air Force EB-66 crews, who often spearheaded the F-105 and F-4 missions launched from Thailand. The EB-66 contained an extremely powerful set of generators, sensors, and jamming devices that could detect and interfere with enemy acquisition radars. Four of the 66s generally orbited just inside the North Vietnamese border, creating a safe channel for the strike force to fly down. The U.S. also initiated anti-radiation missions, codenamed Iron Hand in an attempt to address the growing SAM threat. Iron Hand aircraft, like this two-seat F-105 Wild Weasel, were initially equipped with electronic indicators that allowed crews to ride a SAM's radar signal to its source. Once the station was pinpointed, the radar was destroyed with conventional bombs. In early 1966, Iron Hand flights began operating with the AGM-45 Shrike, a radar-seeking missile that revolutionized SAM suppression operations. The Shrike could be launched several miles from an active surface-to-air missile battery and would continue to home in on the installation's radar as long as it remained online. Upon impact, the SAM's guidance system was instantly rendered useless, 
even for missiles that had already been launched. They didn't often hit the target, but what they would do is cause the radars to go off, and that, of course, impaired their ability to keep tracking on us. But you reach a point, such as around Hanoi, where there's just so many of the SAM installations, there was three concentric rings around Hanoi of surface-to-air missiles that uh, the Shrikes could neutralize some, but uh, it just wasn't possible to neutralize all of them. The Shrike did reduce the surface-to-air missile threat, but it could rarely protect pilots from SAM attacks that had already been launched. To make matters worse, the primitive ECM packages aboard most strike aircraft could only alert a pilot to potential threats, a capability that was quickly rendered useless. The ECM equipment, electronic countermeasures equipment, although okay, was was not designed to counter the kind of threat that you experienced uh, when you flew into a high threat area like Haiphong or Hanoi. It gave you indications that a missile or radar was tracking on you. That's fine if there's one or two, but if there's 20 of them, it doesn't matter. We used to just turn down the volume because it didn't matter. The Air Force began experimenting with a more powerful ECM pod in late 1966 that was supposed to allow strike crews to independently jam enemy radar. The pods were relatively weak by modern standards, but did appear to offer limited protection. It seemed to work very, very well because they'd still fire the SAMs, and the SAMs would come flying through our flights, oftentimes really quite close to us, but they wouldn't detonate where we were. So the proximity fuses or whatever that they had just weren't working, and so we were able to survive a very, very high threat defensive weapon. The battle for air superiority and the struggle to combat SAMs commanded tremendous attention. But ground fire remained the greatest threat to U.S. strike pilots. Bolstered by larger caliber anti-aircraft guns arriving from China, areas in and around Hanoi and the port of Haiphong became some of the most heavily defended positions in history. Only eight thuds were lost to MiGs and SAMs during 1966, but more than a hundred were brought down by ground fire. High loss rates had a tremendous effect on morale. Evening wakes in which airmen toasted comrades who had been lost during the day became a tradition. To make matters worse, it became clear that North Vietnam was not going to buckle under the weight of rolling thunder. A protracted campaign in which many more would be lost seemed inevitable. Yet the pilots continued to fly each day, confident that they would make it back safely, but hoping that it would all be over soon. You had to believe that it wouldn't happen to you. There's the, the golden BB theory. You, you weren't there unless you wanted to fly, so you flew. And the theory was that, hey, you have no control. You have to do your best. You do what you were trained to do, and if it's your day, it's your bad day, it's your bad day. The golden BB is one that comes out of nowhere. The intensity of rolling thunder bombing operations against North Vietnam escalated dramatically in mid-1967. Frustrated by a lack of progress, President Johnson released numerous targets that had previously been off-limits to strike crews. At the time of the escalation, Air Force and Navy assaults were evolving into much larger, integrated strike packages that included numerous supporting aircraft. Major Air Force assaults typically included several flights of F-4s to suppress the threat of MiGs, several EB-66s to jam North Vietnamese radars, and several wild weasels to suppress the threat from SAMs. Navy assaults also evolved from individual strikes by two or four aircraft into what became known as Alpha strikes that could contain as many as 120 strike and supporting aircraft from multiple carriers. The Navy began launching as many as three Alpha strikes a day against major targets in North Vietnam as the pace of operations intensified. 
the missions were extremely complex and often resulted in several casualties. They were pretty complicated operations. A lot of uh, coordination, a lot of training, and a lot of skills involved. And over the target, of course, it would get very busy with lots of airplanes and lots of uh, surface-to-air missiles and artillery. At that time, Hanoi was uh, the most heavily defended place in the history of warfare against uh, air attacks. North Vietnam was divided into six target areas known as route packages to clarify the operational responsibilities of Air Force and Navy crews. But the notorious region in Route Pack 6 remained split between both services. It contained the vast majority of the country's industrial base, the heaviest concentration of anti-aircraft defenses, and the cities of Hanoi and Haiphong. The area is relatively small geographically, and by mid-67, North Vietnamese radar operators had become accustomed to U.S. tactics and had developed highly sophisticated tracking techniques. The increasing complexity and danger drove many strike force commanders to assert much greater control over their day-to-day -day operations. As a force commander at that time, I took tremendous time in figuring my route. And if the frag order uh, did not go along with what I thought was the proper way to attack this target, I, as the force commander, disregarded the frag. And I realized that sometimes that's not a good thing to do. But in this case, it was. They were very far removed from the day-to-day -day things and the changes in the enemy air order of battle. And hey, we've just been there. You know, the day before, I've been there. I know where that, that lead, that SAM lead is, and I know where that 57 is, and I know where that 85 and that 100 is. I know where those guns are, because I was there. The experience gained by strike crews in the first phase of Rolling Thunder began to pay off in a major way in mid-1967, when several major targets were released for the first time. On August 11th, 26 F-105s launched on a mission to strike the Paul Doomer Bridge. The bridge was an essential rail and road link that crossed the Red River on the outskirts of downtown Hanoi. It was the largest bridge in North Vietnam and could be seen by pilots flying missions throughout the region. But for more than two years, it had remained strictly off limits. We've been hitting airfields there for about a week. And Ho Lock Airfield is almost due west of Hanoi. So I said, hey guys, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're kind of come off the tankers, we're gonna drop down to the top of the hills, eight, 10,000 feet, and we're gonna go right at Ho Lock. And just before we get to Ho Lock, and they'll start shooting just before we get there, trust me, we're gonna Make about a five degree turn to the right, and we're gonna go right downtown Hanoi, roll in over the lakes, and we're gonna knock down the Dover Bridge. We did. Just as I said, as we come over the mountains, there's Holock, and we start for it, the whole world lit up. You know, it was perfect timing, because like, hey, they're coming after this airfield. 26 thud crews swarmed down on the bridge in three waves. Each flight was escorted by eight F-4s for flak and MiG suppression and four F-105 wild weasels to guard against the threat from SAMs. One man was shot down and captured, but the strike was a success. Several bridge spans were damaged and one of the pilots scored a direct hit, dropping the center section into the river. For the first time in the war, the massive and vital Doomer Bridge was out of action. Authorization for assaults against North Vietnamese airfields was perhaps the biggest change in targeting policy. The first strike was launched against Hua Lok in April of 67. But for several months, the main airfield at Phuc Yen remained off limits. Then in October, President Johnson personally authorized a major raid against the airfield. Strike crews were ecstatic. They knew they would lose some men but many had been waiting for a chance to hit Phuc Yen for years. We were sending roughly two missions a day up to North Vietnam, up to Route Pack 6. 
and we got very, very tired and frustrated coming down Thud Ridge to see the MiG-21s coming out of Fukien Air Base operating with impunity there. We could not touch them, we couldn't engage them, we couldn't make a pass at them in the pattern. You could, we couldn't do anything, it was just totally off limits, and yet these were the defenses that were coming up, and every day when we went up there, they would make passes at us and shoot their IR missiles at us and whatever. A strike force of more than 40 F-105s, supported by dozens of other aircraft, launched on the mission against Fukien in late October. Poor weather had prevented two consecutive strike attempts earlier in the month. Then, as was often the case, the airfield disappeared from the target list. Many pilots were sure they had missed their golden opportunity. By the time they finally rolled in on Fukien late in the month, their desire to put the airfield out of action had reached a fevered pitch. The pilots were so anxious to hit it, so determined, <laughs> knowing that this may be their only, only chance they'd ever had, is that they, they bombed with incredible accuracy. It was unbelievable to see the attack going on in, you know, in progress and then to see the strike films afterwards. I don't think there was a, a target that wasn't hit and destroyed. We, we destroyed a number of MiGs on the ground and tower and all, you know, all that stuff. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. For three days, Fukien and Kat Bai, an airfield near the port city of Haiphong, were pounded by Air Force and Navy bombers. Several aircraft were lost, but more than 20 MiGs were damaged or destroyed on the ground. At least one was shot down, and runways at both facilities were severely cratered. The success of strike crews during the escalation of rolling thunder came at an extremely high price. More than 420 Air Force and 180 naval aircraft were lost in Southeast Asia in 1967 alone. A4 and F-105 pilots continued to suffer the most. Dozens of Skyhawks and more than 100 thuds were lost in combat. Mounting losses began to take a serious toll on strike force morale. The strain was particularly hard felt at the 105 bases in Thailand. New airmen were being rotated into combat, but there weren't enough airplanes or instructor pilots to train men properly while conducting combat operations. Instead, a dwindling pool of pilots was used to meet the extreme demands of strike schedules that had to be filled each and every day. It was not uncommon for a pilot to fly 20 missions, maybe 22 missions in a month. And you think about that, 32 days, and that's flying those missions. And on those other days, he probably was a spare. So he was on the schedule virtually every day. And when you consider the kinds of missions that we were flying and uh, the early goes and so forth, it got to be a, a, a very demanding physical as well as an emotional drain on the on the pilot, so it was tough, very, very tough. The goal for every Air Force pilot in Vietnam was 100 missions. Many opted to fly more, but if a pilot made it to his 100th mission, he could go home. The length of a Navy pilot's tour was tied to the amount of time the air wing was on station. Many airmen amassed more than 200 missions in squadrons that suffered some of the highest loss rates of the war. Loss rates for THUD crews were especially dire. At one point, an analysis of strike operations found that it was statistically impossible for a 105 pilot to fly more than 68 missions without being shot down. We had in the wing a 100 mission board on which the names of all of the pilots who completed 100 missions would be inscribed. We also had a missing man board on which all of those pilots who were shot down 
where they have their names inscribed. The one, 100 Mission Board, was twice as long as the Missing Man Board, which translated says that one out of three guys prior to the time that I left uh, in search of their 100th mission didn't make it. Few things instilled more fear in strike pilots than the prospect of having to bail out over North Vietnam. If they weren't killed on ejection or by a rogue gunner as they parachuted to the ground, they were likely to face years of confinement, mental abuse, and torture. Fortunately for hundreds of airmen, a dedicated search and rescue force was developed in Vietnam that specialized in recovering downed airmen from hostile territory. Air Force rescue attempts were conducted by A-1 Sky Raider pilots, known as Sandys, in conjunction with the crews of HH-3 and HH-53 Jolly Greens. Navy rescues were performed by SH-3 Sea King crews that launched from carriers under the call sign Big Mother. Both rescue forces remained on high alert throughout the day, and during larger bombing raids, the Jolly Greens orbited high above the border of North Vietnam until the last bombing runs had ended. The uncommon bravery of search and rescue crews resulted in the recovery of more than 3,900 airmen, many of whom were pulled to safety as enemy forces arrived on scene and began firing from below. But despite the valiant efforts of rescue crews, hundreds of other airmen were downed in areas that were too heavily defended to affect rescue and were subsequently killed, captured, or never found. Incredibly, though, most pilots continued to fly into combat with almost reckless abandon, even in squadrons that suffered some of the highest loss rates of the war. There was intense camaraderie, and especially among the pilots of more seasoned air wings, a certain sense of invincibility. Senator John McCain remembers the feeling well. It was almost palpable on October 26, 1967, the day that he and 19 other pilots aboard the USS Oriskany were ordered to take out a North Vietnamese power plant. It was one of the first strike missions conducted inside the city limits of Hanoi. And although McCain was concerned that some men might go down, he remained extremely confident. We knew it was a tough target, a small target. We knew it was heavily defended, and we knew it was going to be uh, a very risky business. But again, I guess the best way that I can describe our attitude is that uh, after the briefing and I was headed out to my airplane, I ran into an old friend of mine who was uh, one of the ship's company officers. His name was Lou Chatham, and Lou said, you better be careful this time. We're going to lose some people on, on this strike. And I said, well, you don't have to worry about me, Lou. <laughs> and an hour later, I was in a lake in the center of the city of Hanoi. Bursts from anti-aircraft shells filled the sky as the strike force approached downtown Hanoi. McCain evaded the fire as best he could, but just before he reached the power plant, a warning light began to glow in his cockpit. A SAM battery's radar was locked on his Skyhawk. I got over the target, rolled in, I had indications that a missile was tracking on me or missiles. I had just released the bombs and was starting to pull back on the stick when a missile hit my right wing of the airplane, taking it off. I was at very high speed, headed straight down. I ejected. Uh, the plane was going very fast and was gyrating very badly, so I broke both my arms and hit my knee when I went out. Landed, uh, according to observers, my uh, parachute opened when uh, just about the same time my feet hit the, the lake and went into the lake, uh, tried to inflate my life vest. Uh, I was unable to do so because my arms were broken. I got my teeth around a toggle switch, and inflated the life vest, came to the surface, and a bunch of Vietnamese had jumped into the water. The latest reports, by the way, there must have been about 10,000 of them that have claimed that they pulled me out, but uh, they, they pulled me out, 
<clears throat> pulled me up on the bank. A crowd of Vietnamese came around. They were very angry. Bayoneted me in the ankle and in the groin. Uh, smashed my shoulder with a rifle butt, and uh, it, it was very tense, to say the least. McCain's right knee was also badly broken during ejection. North Vietnamese troops pulled him from the hostile crowd, threw him in the back of a truck, and drove him to a local prison that American airmen sarcastically dubbed the Hanoi Hilton. For the next five years, McCain, like hundreds of other pilots turned prisoner of war, endured severe beatings, mental abuse, and torture. On April 1, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson ordered a halt to bombing operations north of the 20th parallel, effectively ending the Rolling Thunder campaign against North Vietnam. In spite of the dramatic decision, the war in South Vietnam continued to rage on. American forces suffered heavy losses, both in the air and on the ground, while South Vietnamese Viet Cong and North Vietnamese casualty figures reached staggering proportions. American airmen who had been shot down and captured during Rolling Thunder also remained imprisoned in various North Vietnamese facilities. Most endured harsh physical and mental abuse during their confinement. But for many, the anguish created by years of complete separation from loved ones back home was far worse. On March 30th, 1972, North Vietnam invaded the South in an all-out offensive that many analysts had been predicting for years. A week later, President Richard Nixon ordered U.S. airmen to return to the skies over North Vietnam under a bombing campaign that came to be known as Linebacker. Periodic talks aimed at ending American involvement in the war continued. But on December 13th, the North Vietnamese government broke off all negotiations. In response, President Nixon initiated Linebacker II, the first maximum round-the-clock bombing effort against the urban centers of Hanoi and Haiphong. More than 700 B-52 sorties were launched against the cities over the course of 11 days. On December 29, 1972, President Nixon ordered a halt to the massive bombing campaign. Within a week, the North Vietnamese government resumed negotiations that ultimately led to the end of American involvement in the war. Rolling Thunder has been called one of the most ambitious, wasteful, and ineffective air campaigns in the history of warfare. Many who flew in it would agree. They argue that among other things, complex rules of engagement, White House micromanagement, and numerous political restraints ultimately prevented U.S. Air Forces from ending the conflict much sooner. In the eyes of most American servicemen, Linebacker II finally put an end to a tragedy that had dragged on unnecessarily for far too long. It also ultimately ended the confinement of more than 600 prisoners of war, most of whom were F-105 or A-4 pilots who had been shot down during Rolling Thunder. But it could never put an end to the pain and frustration of those airmen who fought hard to bring the conflict to a close years earlier. We finally got mad. We finally did something, and it worked. We could have done it in 65, whatever. We could have taken the dikes out in 65 and starved them. Oh, you can't do that. Well, what the hell do you think we're doing? It's a war, you know, people are dying. We're dropping bombs, stuff's falling on them. This is not any fun. If you go to a war, you go in and you be violent. And you get it over quick and you go home, i.e. the Gulf War, okay? You fight a war and you lose 100 people? That's wonderful. That's phenomenal. That's the way you ought to. You get it over. If you go mess around 
and you put 50,000 names on a wall, you've lost. And we, we can't blame it all on Johnson and McNamara. Not one general officer who ever fell on his sword. We didn't have any Billy Mitchells. And we lost all these people. We lost all these airplanes. Over half of the production run of the F-105 was shot down in combat. That's a record. Not even the zero lost 50% of the reduction rate. And they lost, as I remember. Of course, so did we. <laughs> by communist Viet Cong forces in South Vietnam. But on March 7, 1965, Johnson's policy of limited retaliatory strikes gave way to rolling thunder, a sustained bombing campaign against North Vietnam that lasted for more than three and a half years. In theory, the strategy behind the campaign was simple. Gradually increase the intensity of bombing raids until Ho Chi Minh and the government of North Vietnam realized that a Viet Cong victory in the South was not worth the price. In reality, though, complex implementation of the campaign, coupled with the fierce determination of the North Vietnamese, resulted in one of the largest air wars in history against one of the most heavily defended countries on Earth. Many pilots had serious doubts about the effectiveness of rolling thunder from the start. The chain of command for day-to-day -day operations literally stretched all the way to the White House. President Lyndon Johnson retained almost complete control over which targets could be attacked. Johnson's decisions were relayed to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who in turn provided a list of targets to the Pentagon. Eventually, the list made its way through the chain of command and the targets were fragmented, or fragged, among various Air Force and Navy aircraft stationed throughout the region. The convoluted and highly political targeting process caused tremendous concern among strike crews from the earliest days of the campaign. The first target that I was assigned on the Forrestal, I still remember vividly. I went up to where the briefings took place, I punched in the target number, and. Uh, Pictures of the target came out, and that target had been bombed 27 times before. It was a pile of rubble. It was called the Vin Military Barracks. A very short distance away was a bridge, a bridge that was obviously used to transport supplies and troops to the south. That, that bridge was not on the target list, so we were not allowed to strike it. Dozens of highly strategic targets remained off limits for most of Rolling Thunder. There was a 30-mile restricted area around Hanoi and a 10-mile area around the port of Haiphong. MiG bases and SAM sites that were under construction were also generally off-limits. And strikes were never directed against the extensive network of dams and dikes, which would have caused significant damage to food supplies and flooded vital transportation routes. President Johnson and Secretary McNamara defended these restrictions. Frag orders were often written in great detail, preventing flight commanders from using their discretion to adjust tactics as necessary. The process angered many pilots, who felt that poor planning and excessive control by men far removed from the fighting frequently resulted in unnecessary losses. At Tai Wen Iron and Steel Works, Strike pilots were ordered to fly the exact same ingress and egress routes at exactly the same times against the same targets, day after day. Pilot concerns about the policies and strategies behind Rolling Thunder were further heightened by the declaration of numerous bombing pauses. The first bombing halt was declared only nine weeks into the campaign. So many bombing halts were eventually ordered that a major study by U.S. government historians 
could not account for the exact number that took place. The pauses were intended to encourage the North Vietnamese to reconsider continuing support of war in the South. But in reality, their impact was far different and usually resulted in much worse conditions for pilots when they returned to the skies over North Vietnam. The Vietnamese uh, used these opportunities to jam the roads with trucks and supplies going south. And they told me themselves that they were incredulous that we would uh, give them this opportunity to rebuild their defenses and to uh, supply the south by declaring these so-called bombing pauses. And that, of course, was uh, frustrating to those of us who were trying to uh, conduct the war in a successful manner. As the Vietnam War escalated and the anti-war movement in the U.S. grew, some erosion in morale began to take shape among ground forces that were taking heavy casualties in the South. For the pilots who flew strike missions against the North, there was also anger and frustration. But it was largely limited to debate about the policies and strategies that were limiting their success while costing them dearly. Even though we were severely limited in the kinds of, uh, of combat that we could engage in and the rules of engagement were so strict, there was also a belief that uh, we were uh, going to hopefully bring the war to an end. And remember, this was before the anti-war movement became so strong and uh, so active in the United States. It was still a kind of a, of a uh, certainly in the, circles that I was in, in the military, a belief that we were doing the right thing. U.S. bombing missions against North Vietnam. For minutes, he struggled to fly out to the coast of North Vietnam, which he could clearly see in the distance. But he soon lost all oil pressure. The 105's massive engine ground to a halt, and Barnett's plane started to roll. Seconds later, he was forced to eject. A survival raft became entangled in the lines of his chute as it deployed. He struggled furiously to free more of the canopy as he plummeted toward the jungle below. I was kind of spinning around going down, and there's a beautiful day, and I was sitting there going down. I could see Hanoi, and I'd go swimming around and see Haiphong, and uh, you know, all the energy. I just almost was spent. Anyway, I was going down and I, I got close to the ground and I knew that I, I'd probably fallen fairly fast. And I was going into the trees and so I put my feet together and I felt myself go ricocheting through the branches and then I fell for about 10, 15 feet into a bunch of bushes. So I got out of the parachute and uh, I uh, tried to get away from there pretty quickly and I went up to a little area and I uh, got on my radio and I called them and I said I was ground and I was okay. Barnett managed to evade North Vietnamese troops for two days. But on the third day, he was captured. For the next five and a half years, he remained a prisoner of war in various facilities, including the notorious Hanoi Hilton. Barnett was one of several hundred airmen shot down during the first phase of the American air war against North Vietnam, during a campaign that came to be known as Rolling Thunder. My fellow Americans, as president and commander in chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. On August 5, 1964, President Lyndon Johnson ordered limited airstrikes against North Vietnamese targets in retaliation for alleged attacks against U.S. destroyers operating in the Gulf of Tonkin. Additional strikes were conducted for several more months in response to specific attacks launched.
American pilots flew thousands of bombing missions against North Vietnam throughout the mid-1960s. They confronted the most formidable anti-aircraft defenses on Earth, while operating under the most complex and restrictive rules of engagement in history. Hundreds were shot down and killed. Hundreds more were imprisoned for years. But for more than three and a half years, the men continued to hurl their aircraft into combat each day with the hope that they could put an end to a bloody struggle that ultimately claimed millions of lives. This is the story of the pilots who flew those missions. It is the story of Rolling Thunder. On a beautiful day in October of 1967, Major Bob Barnett was leading a flight of 16 F-105s on a strike mission into some of the most heavily defended territory in North Vietnam. Supporting the flight were several F-105 wild weasels, which had moved out in front of the strike force to guard against the launch of lethal surface-to-air missiles. The pilots received surprisingly light anti-aircraft fire as they approached the capital city of Hanoi. But suddenly, a warning light lit up in Barnett's 105. A SAM site had come online, and at least one missile had already been fired. The flight of weasels immediately turned back to try to help the force. They were coming outbound, and they fired two SAMs. And of course, I knew they were up, and I was sort of looking for them. And the weasel pilot said, no sweat. It's going behind the force. And next thing, this thing goes off right behind me. It didn't hit the airplane. It went off right maybe about 40 or 50 feet behind the airplane. Of course, it blew into the airplane. And the airplane is porpoising, and um, of course, I got fire lights right then. So I turned, and just as I rolled out, I could feel the controls getting stiff. So I looked down, and I saw I had no hydraulic pressure. And there's, of course, a lot of chatter on the radio, so I told the flight to go over on uh, another channel so I could talk to them and find out, you know, what, what they see with my airplane. And so I went over there, and they all checked in, and then I lost my radio. So I wasn't quite sure what had happened. Barnett was just north of Hanoi when he was hit for several actions, citing concerns about a widening war that could involve China or the Soviet Union. But they became increasingly troublesome for strike crews, who felt that they were being sent into combat with one hand, if not both, tied behind their backs. We were very frustrated by our inability to hit targets that need to be hit. We could observe uh, Russian ships coming into the port of Haiphong, offloading surface-to-air missiles. Those missiles taken on trucks and put into position, either around Haiphong or Hanoi, which we could not strike. And then, of course, having to dodge those same missiles uh, sometime later. Debate about targeting restrictions continued throughout the campaign. But there was also tremendous concern about the strategy for employing air assets once a target was authorized. In March of 1967, frags were issued for strikes against the Tai Wen Iron and Steel Works. The steel mill had previously been off limits, despite the fact that it was the only facility in Southeast Asia that manufactured critical bridge sections, barges, and oil drums. On March 10th, F-105s and F-4s from Thailand began launching on missions against the mill. Poor weather prevented the force from launching nine days earlier when less than 300 guns defended the site. By the time the weather broke, more than 1,000 guns and six SAM sites had been moved to within five miles of the target. At least seven aircraft were lost on the first mission alone. Despite mounting casualties, repeated strikes were ordered against the same targets throughout the month. There were three major separate areas in a steel mill. 
One was the ability to transport the steel out, load it, and get rid of it. We hit it for 10 days. It was dead after the second day. We continued to hit it for 10 days, twice a day. Karat Takli, go in there, bomb snot out of it. And we're losing airplanes like when I was We probably lost 15 or 20 airplanes on a stupid uh, 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 rail facility. Then we moved over and took out the blast furnaces. And we did that for 10 days. Then it was dead after the second day. And they moved in more and more Sims, more and more guns, more and more MiGs. We lost a whole group of other guys. Then we went to some other piece of crap. And by the time we're through, we've been here for 30 days. The place looks like the moon. And we could have finished the whole bloody thing in three or four days. Many pilots attributed heavy losses at the steel mill to poor tactics set forth in the frags issued for the strikes. 